Well, I already learned something new today. Did not know that one. Good job, brother. Appreciate that. Great song, great thought, and goes along well with what we're going to talk about uh, this morning. Let's turn to Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26. If you have a Bible with you, I would encourage you to get it out. Uh, if there's one in the pew in front of you, grab it. We're going to be turning to several different places in the Bible in this time of our worship where we study from God's Word. So good to see you this morning. As uh, has already been mentioned, we have a number of our people who are gone and a number of visitors, just a whole bunch of visitors. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, we thank you for those who are visiting from other places. Thank you to those who are visiting from here in the community. And uh, if you have a visitor's card and you got one of those, please fill that out. And uh, especially if there's something particular that brought you here this morning. If there's something on your mind or something that we can help you with or some issue that you have, anything that we can do, please let us know about that. Write that on that card or tell one of us. Anything we can do to help you to be right with God or to know more about God or deal with some crisis you have going on, we would love to do that. So please just let us know. We're glad that you are here this morning. One thing I want to say before I get started is uh, we are at the end of the year. And because of that, uh, we have finished or we are finishing this week. Uh, the daily devotional readings that we've been doing throughout the year. We, we set as a goal at the beginning of the year that we were going to go through all four Gospels this year. And if you've tracked with me and you've read those emails and you've gone along with that, we've gone all the way through. We're in Matthew chapter 27 and we're going to finish up, I believe it's Wednesday of this week. And uh, so I just wanted to let you know that, that we've been talking, I've talked with the elders and they were all for it, uh, that we're going to continue that work next year. And we're going to be reading through all the epistles of Paul next year. So, in about a week from today, it'll be the 31st, and on January 1st, it'll be a Monday, you'll still get emails. And those emails, you'll get them every day, every weekday. Uh, we're going to be starting in 1 Thessalonians on January 1st. So I wanted you to know that, and uh, if you're not getting those emails, let me know, or more particularly, let Richard Forrester know, uh, so that you can be sure you're getting that and reading along. And let's just say... Maybe some of us are not keeping up with the reading right now, okay? No judgment here, okay? Let's just say that maybe the new year is time to turn over a new leaf and get back into it. We can start over in uh, the epistles of Paul. That would be great, but I appreciate your support for that, and I know that, that many of us have been reading through those, and I hope it's been beneficial to you as it has for me. Acts chapter 26 and verse 8. Acts 26 and verse 8. Paul says, Why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead. Paul is making a speech before Agrippa and Festus here, and he understands that the main issue that a lot of people have with Christianity is this essential claim of the gospel that Jesus rose from the dead. But he asks the question, why is that incredible? Why is it hard to believe that God raises the dead? Why would we expect that there would be some kind of arbitrary limit to God's power? That God can do this, sure, but that, no, God can't do that. Raising the dead is something that's outside of the realm of what God can do. And so Paul challenges his audience to think more deeply about God and the power of God. And that's what I want to do for a few minutes this morning. Some years back, I came across a book. It was a book by a man named J.B. Phillips, and the title of the book was Just Too Good to Pass Up. This was the title. Your God is Too Small. And I, I picked the book up and I perused it. I don't remember anything about it outside the title. But when you get a great title, things just tend to stick, even if the book might not be great. Your God is too small. And I believe that the point Phillips was making in his book was not a belittling someone else's God or anything like that, but instead challenging about our perception of God. That sometimes, like Paul is saying, we try to put limits on God and we think about God in terms that we're more comfortable with. So that God can do so much, but he couldn't possibly do that. One man has said, A.W. Tozer, he said this, What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. And so I want to take my cue from Paul's statement and, and think about how we can sometimes make God too small by the way we think about him. So first of all, our God is too small if I think that God has to do things in a way that makes sense to me. That God has to do things in a way that makes sense to me. That's really the heart of this issue about God raising the dead. Because God raising the dead doesn't really fit into my already existing worldview. In fact... If you accept the premise that God raises the dead, you have to change your worldview. 
you have to now accommodate the fact that perhaps when we die, that's not the end. And so, that's a challenge that Paul says, you can't think that God couldn't do this. Just because it may not make sense to you, doesn't make it untrue. Your God, Paul says, is too small. Turn with me over to Romans chapter 11. Just over the next book over, Romans chapter 11. And verse 33, Romans 11 and verse 33. As Paul has summed up this incredible section, Romans 1 through 11, talking about everything that God has done, how God has brought the Gentiles in, how God has saved man through his grace, how now we can be free from sin and live in the Spirit. In Romans 11 and verse 33, he says, Oh, the depth and the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways! For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. So he says God's judgments are unsearchable. His ways are inscrutable. And who are we to advise him? Does God need an advisor? God's not really on the market looking for someone. Who will tell me what to do and think? God is beyond all of that. But... But I want you to realize that when you read what Paul is saying here, that God's ways are unsearchable and inscrutable, that he doesn't need counselors and advisors, what he is saying is that by definition, God's ways are not always going to make sense to us. By definition, God's ways are not always going to be what we think are right and good. Because they're God's. See, if they were what we thought made sense, then we would be God. But since they are what God says makes sense then we are not God. Instead, we are the one who has to adjust to God rather than God adjusting to us. Turn with me over the page to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians 1. We're just going to keep marching forward a little bit in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse 21. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 21, it says, For since, 1 Corinthians 1, 21, For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Now first he says, back in verse 21, he says, Since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom. Which is to say that we cannot come up with God on our own. That we don't think our way to God. That as some say, the answer is not inside us. The answer is outside us because we cannot know God on our own through wisdom. God has to reveal himself to us. And because of that, Paul goes through a a long elaboration of how God has then appealed to us. And he talks about how God has appealed to us in a way that doesn't make sense. Verse 22, for Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews, and folly to Gentiles. So he gave a message that nobody liked. But everybody disliked it for different reasons. So the Jews disliked it because they were seeking a sign, not a cross. And the Greeks disliked it because they were seeking wisdom, not what they call foolishness. Everybody looked at that and said, that's not what I want. And they turned their nose up at it. And in doing so, they declare that God doesn't make sense. What God's doing, that doesn't make sense. I'm not going to subscribe to that. A God who would send his son to die this humiliating death is not what I'm in the market for. It doesn't make sense. And so, God, through his foolishness, verse 25, shows that he is wiser than men. And that the weakness of God is stronger than men. And now the humble pursue God, even though they see what he is doing as foolishness. And so, the humble are exalted, the exalted are humbled, and no flesh may boast in the presence of God. I think we have to see that what God is doing in the gospel is genius, because it is not something we could come up with. Look in chapter 2 with me, chapter 2 and verse 6. 
In chapter 2 and verse 6 he says, Yet among the mature we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away, but we impart a secret and hidden wisdom which God decreed before our, the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. So there is wisdom in this, he says, but it is a divine wisdom. It's not a wisdom of this world, because the wisdom of this world cannot achieve God's wisdom. By definition, then, God's ways are not going to make sense, because they're God's, and we're not God. But the question is, if God's ways don't make sense to me, does that somehow change God? Does that make God not really God? See, if I believe that God has to do things in a way that makes sense to me, my God is too small. I am trying to minimize God into someone who is subject to my understanding. And we actually see a number of Bible characters who have that very problem. They believe in God, but their God is too small. Go with me to the book of Job, Job chapter 10. This is Job's problem, or at least part of Job's problem. Job chapter 10. <clears throat> Job is blessed by God. He lives this life that is upright and godly, and God blesses him with all of these possessions and family. And yet, at the insistence of the Satan, the accuser, in Job chapter 1. God allows Job to be attacked and all those things to be taken, really in one fell swoop. One fell swoop. And then in chapter 2, he loses his health. His wife turns on him. And so the book of Job is how Job is trying to wrestle with all that has happened to him. How can God allow a righteous person to suffer? It does not make sense to Job. And you hear it in his language. Job chapter 10 and verse 1, he says, I loathe my life. I will give free utterance to my complaint. I will speak in the bitterness of my soul. I will say to God, do not condemn me. Let me know why you contend against me. Does it seem good to you to oppress and to despise the works of your hands and favor the designs of the wicked? Have you eyes of flesh? Do you see as man sees? Are your days as the days of man? Are your years as a man's years that you seek out my iniquity and search for my sin, although you know that I am not guilty and there is none to deliver out of your hand? Job is confused. God's ways don't make sense to him. Look again at verse 3. Does it seem good to you to oppress, to despise the work of your hands? Is this what you think is good? Verse 2. Let me know why you contend against me. This is Job's question. He cannot get around it. He cannot see any way to resolve the problem. I'm righteous. God is punishing me. God is punishing the righteous. It doesn't make sense. This is not fair. God, you're not fair. Job's God was too small. And so what God does is, he reveals himself to Job in the whirlwind in chapter 38. And he begins to ask Job questions that Job cannot answer, revealing how little Job can make sense of anyway. And I want you to read with me his response in Job 42. Job 42, at the very end of the book, <clears throat> when Job responds to all that God has said, his vision of God has grown. Job 42 and verse 1. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear and I will speak. I will question you and you make it known to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Job has had an experience through which he now sees God on a much grander scale. Did you notice that at the end of Job, things don't make any more sense to Job than at the beginning of Job? His understanding hasn't changed. His vision of God has changed. Job's God was too small. And now Job's God has grown. You understand, I'm using that accommodatively. Job's God, in his vision of God, had to be big enough to allow God to do things that didn't make sense to him and still be everything he knew God was. Go with me over to the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk has a similar problem. <clears throat> I'll be quiet while I let everybody sing the songs, the book of the Bible song, to find the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk. 
Habakkuk has a similar problem. Habakkuk is a prophet who is given a message from God after he complains, and the message doesn't square with what Habakkuk knows about God. Habakkuk chapter 1 and verse 2, he says, O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear, or cry to you violence and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity? Why do you look idly at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise, so the law is paralyzed, and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. So you see the book begins with Habakkuk saying, God, what are you going to do? Everything is terrible. Wickedness is abounding. Where are you, God? And then God answers. Habakkuk 1 and verse 5. Look among the nations and see. Wonder and be astounded, for I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, who march through the breadth of the earth and seize dwellings not their own. Uh-oh. So now Habakkuk has complained about how bad things are among God's people. And God says, oh yes, I know, I'm sending the Babylonians. Which is scary. And which is also confusing. Because the Babylonians are more wicked than the Jews. So how can this be? And this doesn't make any sense to Habakkuk. You see his complaint a little further in chapter 1. He says in verse 12, Habakkuk 1 and verse 12, Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. O Lord, you have ordained them as a judgment, and you, O Rock, have established them for reproof. You who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? You make mankind like the fish of the sea, like crawling things that have no ruler. So here he is. Habakkuk says, this doesn't make any sense to me because you're letting the Jews, your people, be defeated by a, a more wicked people. How is that helping anything? You're too good for that, God. This doesn't make sense. Habakkuk's God was too small. Because Habakkuk's God doesn't have to. It makes sense to Habakkuk. And so when you come to Habakkuk chapter 3, Habakkuk finally comes to the conclusion that this is the way this is. And this is the way God is. And he says, I'm going to trust God no matter what happens, even when the enemy comes, even when bad things happen to God's people. God has to do things that make sense to me. If I believe that, then my God is too small. You know, we need to get used to this fact about God. That sometimes, because he is God, it's not going to make sense. In fact, it seems to me that God sometimes does that on purpose. God will do things like say, child sacrifice is terrible, and then tell Abraham, go sacrifice your child. God will do things like warning them, don't make a king, and then making them a king, and through them blessing the people and blessing all of us through the king and the Messiah. So, why does that matter? Part of this has to do with how we approach God. Because he is God, we don't approach him demanding that he do something or be something or think something. That God that we make demands of, that God is too small. That is not the God of the Bible. But this may be most relevant because we live in a scientific age. We live in an age where to understand something to be true, we have to test it. We have to examine it, we have to do experiments, we have to isolate the variables, and then we reproduce it over and over again. And that's how we find in our time what is true and what is not true. And that has borne incredible benefits for our society. But if we are expecting that we will be able to scientifically measure God, if we are expecting that we can say, God, I need you to prove that you really exist. Show me a sign. Give me something. Something irrefutable. Something I can't ignore. Something that can't be explained any other way. Suddenly, we are telling God what to do and what to be. And if we expect God to prove himself to us, that God is too small. And if we somehow, and this, this beggar's belief, if we somehow think that because God doesn't do that, he doesn't exist, as if his unwillingness to do something proves he doesn't exist, that God is far too small. This also matters because sometimes we wrestle like Job with why do things happen? 
we want to know, well, what's, what's the cause behind every event? We, we want to know about the headlines, but particularly we want to know about every event that goes on in our families and our lives. Why did this happen? What's God doing? What's this about? And sometimes we're going to come to conclusions that I just don't know. This just doesn't make sense to me. I can't explain it. And sometimes, because I, I serve in the capacity as a preacher here, sometimes people come to me with their own questions about this. And, and I'll just say that the fact that I serve as a preacher does not give me any special insight into all the different workings of God. Sometimes we just have to say, I just don't know. But does God have to be someone I can explain before I understand that he is good or that he is real? If God has to make sense to me before he is real, then my God is too small. We could go on and on with this. I, I, I could tell you things that I have questions about or issues about. I don't understand fully why God would want to communicate with us through a book. That's a bit odd to me. It doesn't always make sense to me. I don't understand why God would use people. Because I am a people and I know people. I don't understand why God would use people to communicate his word. But he does. And the fact that I can't explain it all, the fact that God doesn't always make sense to me, really doesn't relate to whether he is that way or not. But if I think he cannot be working in a way that doesn't make sense to me, my God is too small. The second thing is that my God is too small if I believe that God has to do what I want him to do. Let's go to the book of Judges, chapter 6. Judges 6. <clears throat> we studied about this when we were studying the book of Judges in the back class. And this is about how Gideon is called by the angel. In Judges chapter 6, they have an interesting exchange. Judges 6 and verse 12. It says, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, Please, sir, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. If God is with us, why isn't he doing everything for us that we'd like for him to do? If God is with us, then why are things so bad? Why are things not the way I want them? And there is no room in this for the idea that God may be about to do something, which he is, or that there might be some other explanation, which kind of goes back to what we talked about a moment ago. But see, the idea that Gideon has is that God has to act in certain ways and in certain times. God has to do it the way I need him to do it, or else... He's not really God. He's forsaken us. There is no God, at least not practically speaking. God has to do what I want him to do. And that God is too small. The problem here, when we talk about God being what we want him to be, doing what we want him to do, is that we very quickly end up creating a God whose primary characteristic is that he does whatever I want him to do. We might think of him kind of like a genie. He does what I like, and if he doesn't do what I like, then I dismiss him, and I assume he's forsaken me and he's against me, and therefore he's not of much value to me. So if God is what I want him to be, then suddenly I've changed God into my own image. This is Psalm 50 and verse 21 where God says, These things you've done, I've been silent. You thought that I was one like yourself. You thought I was like you. That is, that I turned my eyes away from evil things, and that's... That's not God. God's not like us. And we don't get to tell God who he is and how to be. Let's go to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. The idea that I'm getting at here is that we begin to fashion God after the order of what we want. And there is a word for that in the Bible. Fashioning a God like we want him to be, that word is idolatry. Where we take something, and maybe it's a, it's a physical piece of wood or stone, and we, we fashion it the way we think it should look. But it also has to do with we, we give it certain characteristics and attributes that we like. And whatever we like and think should be God, that becomes God. Romans chapter 1 talks about that process. Romans 1 and verse 21. It says, For although they knew God, 
They did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So there is an exchange that takes place. You see it there in verse 23. They exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man. And then you see it again in verse 25. They exchanged the truth about God for the lie. So when we fail to honor God as God, when we fail to be thankful to God, we begin that exchange where we, we exchange what God really is, his true essence, his true nature, for something that is more tangible, something that we can fashion, the creature rather than the creator. We begin to recreate God after our own wishes. So God needs to be this way. I like people who are patient, so God needs to be patient. I like people who are tolerant of other sin, so God needs to be tolerant of sin. After all, wouldn't God feel the way about this that I feel? And sometimes people will be so bold as to say, you know, I couldn't believe in a God who would do X or Y. I couldn't believe in a God who would say this or that. And what they are saying is, I'm not going to believe in a God who is not what I want him to be. A God who doesn't do what I want him to do. And so eventually, while I don't call it an idol, and I may even still call him Jehovah, the God that I serve begins to reflect me more than his own attributes. When we make the God so that he does what we want him to do, we lower him, we distort him, we run his incredible glory through our finite minds. When God has to do what I want him to do, when God has to be what I want him to be, my God is too small. That's the problem with idols. Idols are just too small. So, we long for a God who will do what we want. A God who will respond when we pray just the way we want him to pray. And we have this issue in prayer. It is very common. For all people, Christians and those who are not Christians, to be frustrated about the process of prayer. They are frustrated because prayer does not work according to a, a certain schedule. When I pray, then within the hour or within the week, I get what I've asked. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. Sometimes it's far later, sometimes it's in a very different way. Sometimes we never get what we've asked for. And so we ask the question, well, what, what good is prayer? What good is a God who doesn't do what I want him to do? I asked him, and I don't know what happened. Can't trust prayer. But think about that. What we are saying in that mentality is that God has to do what I want him to do, or else he's not really God. We try to refashion God as a God who always does exactly what I think is best. God becomes my servant instead of the other way around. And that God is too small. Very often, we create a caricature of God, where we take one attribute, one side of God that we like a lot, and we ignore the rest. So I don't like God's prohibitions against sin. So I just want to focus on his love. That's what I'll do. I don't want to think about how I need to forgive other people who have hurt me. That's really hard. So I would rather just focus on how God forgave me. That, that's nice. I like that. And I don't want to think about how God says sometimes we're going to have to suffer persecution and hardship in life. So I'd rather just focus on the part that talks about peace. So, so that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to selectively choose what God's really about. As if somehow by ignoring God, we change him. That God is too small. We could go on and on with this. I, I hope you see. I really could, and, and I'm not just saying that. But I'm not going to. The point I'm trying to get at in this lesson is that 
these efforts that begin as efforts to understand God can sometimes become ways we try to tame God. Thinking that God has to do things in a way that makes sense to me. As we try to make sense of God, eventually we may reach the point where where we just throw away the things that don't make sense. And when we want God to do what we want him to do and to answer and respond to our concerns, sometimes we can make God subject to our concerns. Sometimes that can become taming God. There's an image that is very vivid to me that illustrates this point. C.S. Lewis, in his Chronicles of Narnia, pictures Jesus as Aslan, the lion, who's also the king. And one of the characters, the little girl, when she learns that Aslan is a lion, she asks the question, is he quite safe? And the beaver says, who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. I think sometimes we want to deal with God by trying to make him safe. By trying to tame him. But we need to remember we are dealing with God. He is a God who does not depend on us. We depend on him. He is a God and by definition sometimes we're not going to be able to explain him. He is a God and by definition sometimes we're not going to be able to manipulate him. He is going to do whatever he wants no matter what we think or do about it. He is God. So he isn't safe. But he's good. And you can understand, given those facts about God, why we might want to tame him. Because it can be risky to deal with a God like that. Like a God you read about in the Bible. It can be risky. He might have a different plan in mind for my growth than the one I have in mind. You know, mine is the one where I'm kind of comfortable and then I have this slowly gradual kind of growth. God may have a totally different plan in mind for my growth. He may be willing to make me supremely uncomfortable to improve me. He might use me as an example of suffering, the way he used Paul. He might want me to suffer financial trouble or have health problems or family issues because in some way that can help achieve his ends. He might want me to use my talents in a way that's far outside my comfort zone, and I don't like that. He might strip away things from me that are interrupting my fellowship with him. Things that I'm comfortable with and I don't want to be stripped away. See, it feels like it might be easier to limit him to trite cliches that I can explain. And so reassure myself that God would never do this or this or that. But that God is just too small. And it can be risky to deal with a God like the God of the Bible. And it can be risky to have faith in a God like that. Because there is no assurance that you will get everything you ask for, even if you really want it. Because there is no assurance that God is going to make it all the way you want it. In fact, there's sort of the opposite assurance, that he's probably not going to make it all the way you want it. Because the way we want it is not as good as his vision for us. But to trust in God the way he is, knowing the way he is, that's risky. Do you remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? These three men in the kingdom of Babylon are are put in front of this giant idol statue. And they're told to bow down. And when they don't, they're called before Nebuchadnezzar, the most powerful man on earth at the time. And he says, if you don't bow down, you're going to be thrown into this fiery furnace. And their response... If this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. The courage of these men is amazing. But their understanding of God is amazing, too. They say plainly, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us. That's not a problem for God. There's nothing that's going to be too great for God. But the question is not really about whether God is able. 
But it's that we don't, we don't get to boss God around. If God decides not to do that, that's also his choice. He's God. And so they say, but if not, if he doesn't, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. We're still not going to do it. Even if our God doesn't save us, we're still going to serve him. Because we don't serve God just based on the fact that he does what we want. We don't serve God just for the blessings he gives us. We serve God because it is right to serve God and because we love our God. Not because we have him in our thrall and he must do what we want. Their God is not too small. Their God is a God who is able but deserves service no matter what he does. Now, to put faith in a God like that is like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It is risky. Because it's clear to me that they did not know whether they were going to live or die in that moment. And yet God does save them. That's where we are. We have a God who of his own volition, his own choice, has chosen to interact with us. And from his own Volition, he has chosen to love us despite our rebellion. And to me, I don't know if this study helps you at all, but to me, that is made even more amazing based on what we thought about this morning. That a God who we have no claim on whatsoever, who can do whatever he wants, has chosen to love us. And he has chosen to send his son to die for us. So, through all the sacrifice and through all the things that he has done to try to reach out to us, all he wants is a relationship with us, to act for our good, to live eternally with us. That God is not too small. That is a God who is worthy of our worship and worthy of our allegiance. If there is someone here this morning who needs to respond to the overtures of God, a God who is reaching out to you through his son Jesus and the sacrifice and the blood that's been shed for you to take your sins away. And you're ready to turn away from your sin to be baptized into Christ. If there is any need that we can help you with, we invite you to come to the front right now as we stand and sing to encourage.